Hello all, and thank you for joining us today for a webinar organized by Neon in Athens as part of our program 112 Climate Zone uh, within the framework of the World Weather Network. We are so happy to see so many of our World Weather Network partners here with us. Well, my name is Joanna Mimi, and along with Fanny Scafadaris and Andrew Spiru, I'm uh, the co curator of 1112 Climate Zone a contemporary art project with a focus on climate change and the environmental crisis as an urgent and ongoing condition. Uh, along with the artistic contribution from artists Tavros Lesparatos and Natalia Tsukala, our station on the network has also published a series of podcasts broadcast from Greece and Alert for the Climate. NEON is a non-profit organization organization founded in 2013 in Athens by collector and entrepreneur Dimitris Daskalopoulos and works to bring contemporary culture closer to everyone, committed to broadening the appreciation, understanding and creation of contemporary art in Greece. Elina Kouturi is the director of NEO. Today, I have the great pleasure to, of introducing our presenter, and uh, scientific advisor for our program, Professor Prodromo Zanis. Uh, Professor Zanis is an atmospheric physicist at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. And uh, he's the lead author of chapter six of the 2021 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, as well as a member of the scientific committee of the Greek Ministry for Environment and Energy for facing climate change. Uh, well, Professor Zanis will today be presenting a short webinar on the leak of global warming levels with climate change in the Mediterranean region, signals from Greece. The, pres the presentation will highlight the link between uh, global warming and climate change in the Mediterranean region, one of the most sensitive areas on earth uh, due to the anthropogenic climate change. Of course, all of you, uh, you can address any question to Professor Zanis uh, through the Q&A button and would be answered by the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Zanis, thank you very much. Uh, over to, to you and we are looking forward for your presentation. Thanks, uh, Ioana, for introducing me. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me being a partner, a scientific advisor in the project of NEON. Uh, the aim of my presentation is to discuss briefly the links uh, between global warming and uh, climate change in the Mediterranean region, based on the state of the art scientific knowledge that we have, as well as I'm going to give you some insights on uh, about uh, the Greek climate and climate change in Greece, based on uh, the involvement of our university in the national network of climate change uh, and in TIPACTS. So I'm just going now to share my screen. Just give me one minute. I hope that uh, it is uh, fine now with uh, my screen. And uh, I will start my, my presentation just showing uh, uh, something about the energy balance of Earth. Practically the climate system, the Earth's climate system receives all of its energy from the sun. But at the same time, it also radiates heat energy, heat radiation to space. And uh, practically, you know, the climate is controlled by this actually balance between ingoing and outgoing radiation. And of course, uh, for what is uh, uh, included in the mean in uh, in the atmosphere, which is very crucial, because the atmosphere uh, has some composition. There are 
certain gases, what we call greenhouse gases, which have the potential to absorb and re-radiate part of the outgoing long wave radiation, which is emitted from the earth. So this balance is uh, controlled and if we, by all these processes, in going outgoing and atmospheric composition, and um, if we look the last 50 years, since 1970s, there has been persistent imbalance in the energy flow that uh, has led to excess energy being absorbed by different components of the, uh, of the climate system. So practically, we have an imbalance in the Earth's energy budget, and this imbalance is due to anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, which led to this imbalance. And part of this excess energy that is stays in the climate system, most of it, of course, is absorbed from the ocean, about 91% and the rest is absorbed by land and the ice. Usually we use a measure to speak about this imbalance in the energy balance. And this is what we call radiative force. And if the radiative forcing is positive, that means we have a positive imbalance that will lead to heating of the earth. If we have radiative forcing negative, that will lead to uh, negative imbalance and cooling of the earth. Greenhouse gases uh, induce positive radiative forcing and heating. Okay. Uh, and uh, if we, when looking at the anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases and other precursor species of gases and uh, precursor species for aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, we can look, we can see clearly in this graph that we have an exponential increase in these emissions from the pre industrial era uh, to the present day. So, in all different kinds of gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases like NOx, nitrogen oxides. Sulfates, we have this exponential increase, which is practically due to anthropogenic, to increasing anthropogenic em emissions. Uh, these increases of emissions, of course, can lead to accumulation in the atmosphere of gases. And so the composition, the atmospheric composition, the concentration of several gases, greenhouse gases, is increasing in the atmosphere. And that we can see in this uh, slide, which present not emissions. Now we see practically concentrations over the last thousand year. And uh, again, we see clearly the jump, the exponential increase uh, in the last uh, two centuries from the pre-industrial era to the present time. For carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, for methane, which is a green, greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, and also in other precursor emissions of, uh, that lead to sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere. I can uh, speak a little bit for the role of these sulfate aerosols in a, a later slide, because commonly these sulfate aerosols have a contracting effect with two greenhouse gases. So while greenhouse gases warm uh, the atmosphere, warm the, the, the Earth's atmosphere, the sulfate aerosols lead to cooling because they scatter the solar radiation. So uh, we have more losing outgoing radiation and they can uh, lead practically to cooling uh, of the atmosphere. I, I will come later on, on this issue. So uh, that's a, a nice uh, figure. That's from the latest IPCC report uh, on which, as Ioana mentioned to you, I was a lead author in one of the chapters, chapter six. 
And uh, if you see in this graph with bars, we see the radiative forcing from each one of the different greenhouse gases due to their increase in concentrations from the pre-industrial time to today. For example, carbon dioxide on its own can uh, uh, have a positive radiative forcing of around 2.16 watts per square meter. But uh, uh, I'm not going to stay on the numbers, just to, what I want to mention here is that uh, carbon dioxide is the main driver for the total radiative forcing from the pre-industrial times to today. So it's one of the most important or the most important greenhouse gas that can enhance the so-called greenhouse effect and inducing more warming in, in, in the atmosphere. And with the other bars here, we see what is the contribution of methane, which is roughly one quarter of carbon dioxide and other species like the nitrous oxide, halogens, and ozone, which is another greenhouse gas, because ozone has been also increased from the pre-industrial time to today. Nevertheless, <laughs> apart from this positive radiative forcing that can ship the atmosphere, as I told you earlier, there are some aerosol species, sulfate aerosols, that can cool the atmosphere. And if we can see totally the uh, increase of aerosols from the pre-industrial time to today have a negative radiate effect, which somehow tries to moderate, to counter, uh, counteract uh, partially the effect of the positive radiate force of greenhouse gases. So if we put all together, uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols, we have a total positive green, uh, positive radiative forcing, which uh, uh, can induce uh, warming, heating of the atmosphere. And let's go now to some uh, uh, concentrations, to some instrumental uh, observations of the last uh, two centuries. And in this graph, we see the instrumental observations uh, and what they show to us about the uh, changes in mean global near surface temperature of the earth. And that's with the orange line. That's here practically the differences from uh, a reference period. So what we see here are anomalies. It's not actual temperatures. But we see clearly that from till the end of the 90s or the 19th century till today, we have a tension of increasing temperatures and the warming, which is practically about 1.1 degrees from the pre-industrial time to today. At the same time, with the red uh, line, with the red circles, we see the measure carbon dioxide concentrations. These are measurements that started in 1957 at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, uh, in the middle of the uh, Pacific Ocean. And they're considered as you know, representative for the global carbon dioxide concentrations of, uh, in the atmosphere. You see also clearly here from the observations an increasing trend of carbon dioxide. And today, last year in 2021, we reached practically 460 parts per million. We have an increase if we compare with the pre-industrial times, which is roughly about 50%. This is quite important. And, uh, and if you ask me the question, okay, are carbon dioxide, how representative they are, the, the carbon dioxide measurements at Mauna Loa, here I show you carbon dioxide measurements that we also do here in Greece 
in uh, in a station called Finokaya, which is in Creta. You know the island in the Aegean Sea, one of the most beautiful islands in Greece. And the if you compare the measurements that we do in Greece, that's the red line, with the measurements that are taking place at Mount Aloha, you see very comparable concentrations. This somehow verifies what I told you that carbon dioxide measurements at Mount Aloha are representative for the global carbon dioxide CO2 levels. Okay. And let's look now global warming in a larger time scale over the last 2000 year. This is a graph that is well known with uh, the character with the name hockey stick because it's like a hockey stick and so uh, practically that uh, global near surface temperature from the pre-industrial time to today increasing exponentially and that's beyond the natural variability of temperature over the last 2000 years and practically uh, we can say that the warming that we see the last uh, 100 years is uh, unprecedented in more than 2000 years and we can also say that uh, the last century is the warmest period over the last 100,000 years. So we can see the anthropogenic influence to temperature changes over a long time scale. Of course, in the past, before million years, we had also warm temperatures, high temperatures, but for other reasons, natural variability. Now we see practically the anthropogenic effect and uh, this extraordinary, I would say, hockey stick that uh, we see in this graph. And something that is also important for global warming is that it's not homogeneous around the earth. So this graph, this slide with uh, shows uh, <clears throat> how is the warming distributed around the earth. And you will see that, okay, every part of Earth has been warmed from the pre-industrial time to today, but there are parts of this world that has been warmed more. Practically, if you see in the Arctic regions where you have also the ice in the Arctic, you have the highest warming trends. Okay, that's also important because in the Arctic we have the ice. And let's go, I mean, from my introduction about global warming to Mediterranean. And that's something interesting that if we see the warming levels in Mediterranean from the pre-industrial time to today, we can notice if we compare, for example, the blue line, which is the temperatures in Mediterranean versus the green line, which is the temperatures global uh, Earth's temperature, the global average temperature. And you will see that in Mediterranean, the warming is higher than uh, the global warming levels. To say with numbers, in Mediterranean, we have a warming of 1.5 degrees, while globally we have an increase of 1.1 degrees. So that makes uh, easily the statement that, uh, okay, Mediterranean is getting warmer in a stronger, in a higher rate. And that can make also Mediterranean one of the hotspot regions of climate change. Uh, just a little bit to show you also some results, some measurements from Greece. And in this graph, I show you, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, but this graph is in Greek language, but anyway, I can explain to you that uh, with the red line is observations that has been taking place in Athens, in the National Observatory of Athens, while with the blue line is the measurements that uh, we take uh, at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in our department. 
And these two time series are the longest, let's say time series are very characteristic, long time series of measurements for Greece. And you see also clearly that of course the warming trends are stronger if we compare with the blue, with the green line, which is the global warming trends. Uh, that's stronger uh, warming in, in Greece as well in these stations. Of course, we have higher variability, but nevertheless, we see what we noticed, what I noticed earlier about the Mediterranean. So Greece is, reflects what Mediterranean reflects in terms of warming. And uh, now I go back and just to say a few words uh, about uh, the contribution in this warming from the different species that are emitted from anthropogenic activities from the pre-industrial time to today. It's the graphics very similar to the one that I showed you earlier for the radiative forcing, but now is the warming, it's temperature change. So you clearly see, for example, in top of this graph, that carbon dioxide contributes, contributes the most to global warming um, from the pre-industrial time to today again. And then you see how other greenhouse gases contribute and how ozone contributes. And the negative <laughs> effect or the cooling effect from the aerosol. Uh, of course, if we put all together, you end up with the global warming, uh, which is basically the result uh, of all contributions from greenhouse gases and aerosols and the counteracting effect of aerosols uh, on, on, on this. Uh, something that I would like to point to that in order to produce results such as this that I show you, we use global climate models. We use global models because in these models, we have the opportunity to do different tests and quantifications and uh, decompose the contributions of the different, uh, let's say, species of the different gases that are emitted in the atmosphere. And something which is very, very interesting is this graph. It's also from the latest IPCC report. And that shows with the black line is the observations from the end of the 19th century to uh, today. Uh, and with the brown line, it's what we can model, but in this model, let's say experiments, we use both natural variability and the human influence. While if we see the other, the, the, the other line, the let's say green line more or less, is uh, how, what, uh, what is somehow uh, modeled from the global models about the temperature changes, but only, only due to natural variability like solar radiation changes, volcanic activity over the last uh, two centuries. So the point from this graph is that if you only include the natural forcing in, in models, you cannot really simulate correct what you observe. In order to reach to the observed changes, you have to add the anthropogenic influence, the anthropogenic uh, emissions. And the key message the, uh, is that global temperatures, of course, has, has increased by 1.1 degrees, but the human activities are responsible for, all, <laughs> for almost 98% of this increase, which is an important result. Okay, and if you go now to future emissions, future projections from the global models, 
then uh, you have to take into account different scenarios, different socioeconomic scenarios for the different countries. And according to these different scenarios are also the emissions of the different greenhouse gases. For example, just an example to show you the difference between the top emission scenario, which is the SSP 8.5, and the SSP 1.9, which is in the lower scenario. In the upper, in the, in the high end scenario, SSP 8.5, we anticipate no further mitigation measures to greenhouse gases. That's why you have the buildup of increasing greenhouse gases in uh, over the 21st century. In the Low end scenario in SSP 1.9, we anticipate strong mitigation aiming to carbon neutrality by 2050. So these are the two high and low ends. And of course, there are moderate scenarios. And uh, I would say that according to the policies that we follow, more or less we track a moderate scenario, something in the middle between the high and low end. Okay, so according to these scenarios, we can make some projections, some estimates for how, uh, uh, what changes we can have in climate, in temperature, precipitation, and other meteorological parameters. And uh, this is some results for the different scenarios. If we look, for example, on the top uh, left figure is how global temperature will, will change in the future for the different scenarios. And you see that if we go to the low end scenario, then we can um, keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees or below 2 degrees with respect to the pre-industrial time. Mind that current now we are already 1.1 degrees uh, higher than the pre industrial time. Okay. And, but if you go to the high end scenario with no mitigation, the global warming or the increasing reaches something like four to five degrees to the end, towards the end of the 21st century. But it's not only the surface or the global temperature that changing. The other graph here shows the September, in September month, the Arctic sea ice area. And you see clearly that uh, with more warming, depending to the scenario, we have a reduction of the Arctic sea ice. And practically there are scenarios uh, that after 2050, we can even see that we are below a tipping point that practically Arctic will be ice free. Okay, but if you follow some emission scenarios with strong mitigation, uh, like the 1.9 or 2.6, we can keep above this tipping point so that we, uh, we don't have elimination or uh, of all sea ice in, during September, for example, uh, in, in, in the Arctic Ocean. And nevertheless, we see also some other changes in the future, like the acidity of the oceans measured by pH, and the oceans become more and more acidic depending on the scenario. And of course, the sea level rise, uh, which also it's higher and ranges from 20 centimeters to 70 centimeters, for example, or more depending on the, on the scenario. But uh, I was speaking about Mediterranean and why is hotspot. And uh, if we look practically uh, in Mediterranean, we see that with every increment, increment of global warming, the changes get larger 
in regional mean temperature, in precipitation, in soil moisture. For example, if we look at, uh, and, and we take that uh, for global warming levels of one point of uh, 1.5 degrees, the warming in Mediterranean for the different scenarios is something about two degrees Celsius. And if we are going for a global warming of two degrees Celsius, then we have a warming in the Mediterranean of uh, about 2.8. And if we go for a global warming of three degrees, then we have more than four degrees warming in the Mediterranean. And also, as uh, warming, global warming becomes stronger, the reduction of precipitation becomes stronger, uh, ranging, let's say, from about uh, reduction of 15% in annual precipitation in the Mediterranean up to 26% for a global warming of uh, three degrees. And soil moisture also has some tension for reduction. So we see some strong changes that can, we can face in the future, which may have strong impacts. And one of the strongest impacts because of precipitation increase and temperature increase. So you imagine we have more evapora evaporation uh, and we have less also precipitation. And we have at the same time population growth that will lead somehow to a less renewable water resources. And here we see for a scenario of two degrees warming in the future, that we may have a reduction of fresh water, which will be uh, about two to 15%. And the water availabilities may drop some countries stronger to below 500 cubic meter per capita per year in the near future. And that's water scarcity for some countries around the Mediterranean, especially, let's say, the African countries. Furthermore, the couple effect of warming and drought because of the reduction of precipitation can lead practically to an increase in aridity. And this can lead to a subsequent desertification stress of many Mediterranean ecosystems. Uh, that's again for uh, a two degrees uh, warming uh, level, global warming level scenario. Here we see also with uh, the, the countries that face a stronger stress, the certification stress are uh, the ones that in uh, North of Africa, for example, that's the, the brown one, but also let's say Crete can face stronger tension for desertification, South Peloponnese, or in Cyprus Island, or in Sicily, or in Spain, for example, they can face, can, uh, face some strong uh, tension for uh, desertification. And another issue for the Mediterranean countries, because we have many uh, large cities, which are coastal cities. And these coastal cities, due to the uh, increase in sea level, uh, due to the sea level rise, which is, is expected to range as uh, about 20 centimeters to 70 centimeters, uh, from the near future towards the end of the 21st century. Uh, a lot of the mega uh, coastal cities we will face risks because of this uh, coastal uh, risk because of this rise in, uh, in sea level. Uh, that's an important issue. And now, I will close with some key messages that I wanted to give for Mediterranean, how this is linked to global warming. But uh, I will need a few also minutes 
to discuss uh, and give some insights for what we are doing uh, for Greece and what we have been doing in, in uh, uh, climate, uh, in our national network for climate change. And commonly what we are doing in terms of research is that we use regional climate models and what is regional climate model and what is a global model. Uh, imagine here we see two different figures and uh, you see a figure in, on top, which is a very coarse resolution, which we use in global models. So somehow with this global coarse resolution of the models, because we have grid points, Practically, there are some places that cannot be seen from the model, like some lakes, some rivers, some strong mountains, uh, steep mountains, or uh, some islands even cannot be seen from a global model because of its resolution. Uh, and uh, if you use regional climate models, then we downscale this in information and we can provide fine scale climate regional information. This we so-called dynamical downscale. A typical example of comparison of this is something like having a camera with a high resolution, digital resolution, and a camera, a digital camera with very low resolution. What you can see with a, a low resolution camera is much different what you can see with a high resolution camera, the features and all the characteristics. And uh, regional climate models help us to provide this fine scale information, which is important if we speak for impact studies, for climate change impact studies uh, in, uh, in regions like Greece, which has a very steep orography, has islands, has coast, long coastline, so regional climate models are very essential to study uh, such uh, environments. And I will skip this. Uh, of course, we have used many different regional climate models to assess uh, uh, climate change in Greece. But practically, I would like to give you the resolution that we give information is something about 12 kilometers. So every 12 feet, Every 12 kilometers, we can provide climatic information of changes in the future. And <clears throat> now that's focusing on Greece for three different scenarios, future changes, and how this is distributed spatially uh, around Greece. So for temperature, we see practically commonly what we have been expected an increase uh, which becomes stronger uh, for the scenarios that they have no mitigation. So the, the scenario with no further mitigation in the future is RCP 8.5, it's the lower part of this, uh, of this graph, sorry. And, uh, but we see also increases in other scenarios, 2.6 and 4.5, uh, ranging, if we see here for the continental par part of Greece, we have increases lower than two degrees Celsius, which can be more than two degrees for the moderate scenario, which I told you is closer to what we expect in the future. And the RCP 8.5, which is more than five degrees increase. But uh, again, this is a high end. I don't think is, let's say, a realistic scenario for the future from my point of view. And this is something about precipitation changes. And my message from this graph, which is quite complex graph, is that we can see changes, reduction in precipitation, but robust changes decreases in precipitation, we can only see in the second, uh, towards the end of 21st century, like in areas 
for example, here in the uh, western part, in, uh, yes, in the western part of Greece, in Crete, and only, let's say, for the worst scenario, RCP 8.5, which uh, I, I say is the high end scenario on the top. Uh, but we have done also work looking some indices, climatic indices, like the days, the hot days. How many days you will have maximum temperature more than 35 degrees Celsius? And if you see that, we expect really increases, which can be from six days up to seven days for the RCP 2.6 uh, scenario. Uh, and can be even stronger for RCP 4.5 or RCP 8.5. For example, for RCP 8.5, the increase of hot days in the future can be uh, up to 30 days. So you see some signal in the number of hot days and the heat stress from these hot days, or the consecutive dry days, which are also going to increase, especially for the worst uh, high-end scenario, uh, robustly. Something that I would like also to mention is the fire weather index, the risk for fire, not actual fire. And that's something that we have also looked in, uh, in CleanPact, in our network. It's uh, a work from a colleague, uh, my colleague in Creta, Apostolos Vulgarakis, where they have uh, seen, for example, that we can have a considerable increase in the days with fire risk uh, for the different scenarios in the future. And basically in places like hotspot areas, like in Attica here or in Peloponnese, sorry, excuse me. So we have also a risk for more fires in, in the future in the area. And I will end my presentation. This is actually a movie. It's a spirals of climate change for the three different scenarios. This we have developed uh, in, um, in our group uh, in the framework of this um, climate change network. And uh, with this, I would like, sorry, to thank you for your attention and I'm open uh, for any questions. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Professor Zanis, for your fascinating presentation. I think it's uh, clear for all of us that we have a lot of work to do. And of course, thank you all for attending the lecture. Uh, I would suggest you move on to the questions, and I hope you might be able to take some uh, time to answer a couple of them. And I'll start uh, with the first one. Um, looking at the graph you have, um, you have shared with us in your presentation about the air temperature, but also the, the graph that you shared, the abstract, we noticed that there appears a change on the lines around late 90s, early zeros. Is there a critical shift? Thanks, Joanna, for this question. That uh, was uh, a question, a key question for many of the scientists working about climate change. Because indeed, if you see, we have an intensification of warming after 1970s, after the 70s to today, the last 50 years, we have an intensification. And one uh, plausible theory about this has to do with the role of uh, aerosols. This is, I mentioned during my presentation that aerosols are cooling the earth while greenhouse gases warm the earth. So uh, the aerosols, there were some air quality controls and after the 70s, especially, we have a reductions of precursor emissions of aerosols. So we have a reduction of uh, sulfate, for example, aerosols in the atmosphere over the last uh, 50 years in the industrialized part of the world. And imagine that something that cools the earth becomes uh, 
uh, is decreasing its concentration while we keep tracking having greenhouse gas increases. So that means that we have a shift towards an intensification of warming because suddenly the radiative force becomes even more stronger positively. That's uh, one plausible reason. There were other also uh, explanations uh, concerning natural variability, but uh, I think that's something uh, what I explained to you is one of uh, key players about this. Thank you very much. And on, um, on the second question, uh, Professor, can you give us a few examples why this uh, temperature rise of 1.5 degrees is so crucial? Could you explain a bit further? Uh, yes. Uh, I told you that I mean, the, our climate system is a non-linear system. That means that for every degree, for every half of degree of warming, you have nonlinear responses in the climate in the climate system. Uh, with, uh, for example, uh, there are some uh, work that has shown that uh, uh, when we when we reach one point five degrees or two degrees of global warming we can have a much stronger increase in extreme heat waves and extreme events, and also a very strong destruction of uh, coral reefs. That's up to 70 to 90% destruction of coral, coral reefs. Uh, so strong changes in the ecosystem. And another more important reason is what we call tipping points. And what is a tipping point? That's some thresholds in a system that if, we, if you cross this tipping point, the system or the climate system can somehow, the changes can be even faster, stronger, and can be even irreversible, not reversible. And if we keep, for example, our global warming levels, to 1.5 or two, two degrees global warming levels, that means that we'll reduce the risk of crossing these tipping points. And I can give you also some key uh, potential tipping points of our climate systems. One is, for example, the collapse of Greenland sea, uh, of Greenland ice or the Antarctic ice seas. That's uh, that we can cross a tipping point that we can totally collapse on this uh, Arctic ice. Or we can uh, have uh, permafrost thawing, which can, uh, for example, because we have a lot of methane capture in uh, permafrost, which can be uh, released in the atmosphere. And that can accelerate, accelerate, intensify even more global uh, warming. And that's natural. Methane. It's not uh, methane that is uh, anthropogenically emitted, but it will be released because of the permafrost knowing. So, uh, or for example, the overtuning of uh, meridional, Atlantic meridional circulation. That's some climate tipping points which we would be glad or we would like to have low risk of crossing these tipping points. That's why there was strong discussion in policy about 1.5 and 2 degrees in, uh, among the different countries in the conference of, par of parties conferences, on the conferences of parties. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you again, everyone, for your attendance today. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be published in your course on the World Weather Network. It was a great pleasure seeing you, so many of you here, and we wish you all the best for your continued efforts with your respective stations. I uh, hope to see you all again to another presentation or any other event of the World Weather Network. Thank you very much. Thank you, programmers, once again. <laughs>